Deep beneath Sydney's southern suburbs, a $3 billion disaster is unfolding in slow motion. The M6 motorway tunnel sits 90% complete, yet completely paralyzed. Twin four-kilometer tunnels that should be carrying thousands of vehicles are instead filled with water, crumbling concrete, and abandoned machinery. On March 1st, 2024, the ground literally opened up and swallowed a building, revealing something far more disturbing than a simple construction accident. This is a story of how a modern engineering marvel became a cautionary tale of miscalculation, political pressure, and the hidden design flaws that turned Sydney's grand vision into a billion dollar sinkhole. Sydney's southern suburbs have been waiting since 1951 for a solution to their traffic nightmare. That year, the New South Wales government set aside a corridor of land for the F6 extension, later renamed the M6 motorway. For 70 years, it remained nothing more than a line on a map and a promise that never materialized. Families moved into the area, businesses grew, and traffic congestion became unbearable. But the tunnel remained a dream deferred decade after decade. In December 19, that dream finally became reality when the government declared the M6 Stage 1 as critical state significant infrastructure. The project promised to transform daily life for hundreds of thousands of commuters. Drivers would bypass 23 sets of traffic lights between Arncliffe and President Avenue. 2,000 heavy trucks would disappear from local streets. And because of this, commuters would save up to 15 minutes on their journey to the city center. Time that adds up to hours every week and days every year. Engineers chose an unusual approach for this project. Instead of the massive tunnel boring machines that had carved out other Sydney mega projects, they selected road headers. These hundred ton mechanical beasts work differently. They don't drill perfect circles, but instead use a spinning cutter head, studded with tungsten carbide picks to grind and shape the rock. Up to 10 of these machines would work around the clock, chewing through Sydney's Hawkesbury sandstone at 20 to 25 meters per week, using a method called heading and bench. For months, everything went according to plan. The road headers ground forward, crews bolted and shot creeded the walls, and kilometer after kilometer of tunnel took shape. Then March 2024 arrived, and with it, catastrophe. A 10-meter wide sinkhole exploded open in an industrial estate at Rockdale, directly above the tunnel path. The collapse was so violent it ripped the foundations from under a two-story office building, causing it to partially crumble. Workers fled the site in panic, and all tunneling operations stopped immediately. What makes this collapse particularly shocking is the depth, or rather, the lack of it. The tunnel at this point was only 12 to 16 meters below the surface. That's barely four stories separating multi-million dollar machinery from the world above. But here's what most people don't know about that catastrophic March morning. The ground didn't fail without warning. Months before the collapse, concerns were raised and critical decisions were made that would seal this project's fate. The M6 contract wasn't just a standard construction job. It was a design and construct agreement, which meant the contractor consortium CGU, made up of CPB contractors, Gela and UGL, wasn't simply following someone else's blueprints. They were responsible for both designing the tunnel and building it. This distinction would later become the centerpiece of a billion dollar legal battle. According to multiple reports, the lead contractor allegedly chose a cheaper tunneling strategy for the difficult sections. Despite explicit warnings from WSP, a key subcontractor responsible for the engineering design, the problematic stretch at Rockdale wasn't solid Hawkesbury sandstone, it was soft sands and clays that required specialized treatment. Standard practice in such conditions involves jet grouting, where cement-like mixtures are blasted into soft ground to solidify it before excavation begins. The decision to go with a less expensive approach saved money on paper, but it ignored fundamental geological realities. Underground Sydney is not uniform. While much of the city sits on stable sandstone, pockets of unstable material exist throughout the basin. These aren't secrets. Geological surveys and decades of tunneling experience have documented these variations extensively. So, the question wasn't whether difficult ground existed, but whether the chosen methods were adequate to handle it. The shallow depth at Rockdale compounded the risk exponentially. 
Standard tunneling practice maintains significant cover, the term for the amount of rock and soil between the tunnel crown and the surface. 12 to 16 meters of cover is dangerously thin for a major motorway tunnel, particularly in unstable ground. Every meter of depth provides additional weight and pressure that helps stabilize the excavation. Remove that natural reinforcement, and you're essentially digging a hole in ground that wants to collapse. The cheaper approach and shallow tunneling created a loaded gun. And on March 2024, all hell went loose, challenging everything the contractor claimed about Sydney's geology. The first sinkhole appeared without warning on March 1, 2024. 10 meters of solid ground simply vanished, taking a building's foundations with it. Just eight days later, on March 9th, a second sinkhole opened up only 150 meters away. Sydney's construction industry went into shock. Two sinkholes in the same project area within days of each other wasn't normal ground settlement. Something catastrophic was happening underground. CGU claimed their machines had encountered a high-angle reverse fault, a geological formation they insisted had never been documented in the Sydney Basin and therefore could not have been anticipated. To understand why this claim is significant, you need to understand what makes reverse faults so dangerous. Normal faults occur when Earth's crust stretches and one block of rock slides down against another. Reverse faults are the opposite and far more violent. They form under intense compression, where unimaginable forces squeeze the crust until one block grinds its way up and over another. This grinding motion pulverizes the rock along the fault line, creating a zone of shattered, unstable rubble that can extend for dozens or even hundreds of meters. Tunneling through a reverse fault zone is extraordinarily difficult. The rock has no structural integrity. It's essentially crushed gravel held together by pressure and groundwater. Remove that pressure by excavating, and the entire zone wants to collapse inward. Water makes it worse, turning the rubble into flowing mud that can bury machinery and workers in minutes. The 244-meter section at Rockdale had become exactly this kind of death trap. Drone footage obtained by news outlets showed the full horror inside the abandoned tunnel. Water poured down the walls in sheets. Concrete reinforcement hung in twisted fragments. Expensive road headers sat half buried in mud and rock. Millions of dollars worth of equipment, now essentially scrap metal. The scene looked less like a modern engineering project and more like an archaeological disaster site. CGU maintained their position. This fault was unforeseeable, unprecedented, and therefore not their responsibility under the contract terms. But geological experts began questioning this narrative almost immediately. In May 2025, CGU dropped a bombshell. They formally declared the M6 contract frustrated, a specific legal term meaning an unforeseen event had made fulfilling the contract impossible. They announced their intention to exit the project entirely by June 30th, 2025. After months of stalemate, the consortium was walking away from a nearly complete $3 billion tunnel. Premier Chris Minns didn't hide his fury. In a media conference that made headlines across Australia, he delivered a line that would define the crisis. My best advice to the contractor today is to send the lawyers home and bring back the engineers. The statement resonated with frustrated taxpayers who couldn't understand why a 90% complete tunnel had been abandoned while lawyers argued over responsibility. The legal battle centered on the design and construct contract structure. Transport for NS Dollar's position was crystal clear. CGU designed the tunnel, CGU chose the construction methods, and CGU is responsible for fixing the problems their design failed to anticipate. The government argued that the contractor hadn't exhausted available technical solutions. Before declaring the contract frustrated, ground freezing, advanced grouting, and redesigned support systems were all viable options that CGU allegedly refused to pursue because they would eat into profit margins. The financial carnage mounted rapidly. By mid-2025, the government had spent over $5.54 million on legal fees alone, and the original $2.52 billion budget had already exploded to $3.1 billion before the collapse, and nobody would commit to a final figure anymore. The government stopped publishing cost estimates, leaving taxpayers completely in the dark about the ultimate price tag. 
Opposition transport spokesperson Natalie Ward demanded accountability from both sides. She insisted that serious questions needed answers not just from CGU, but from transport for NSW about their oversight during the design phase. How did a design that allegedly ignored subcontractor warnings get approved? Why wasn't more rigorous geological investigation required for the shallow Rockdale section? The implication was clear. The government would share some blame for this disaster. Premier Minns made his own position brutally clear. He wasn't going to hand over a blank check to anyone, contractor or otherwise. If CGU walked away, the government would find another company to finish the job, no matter how long it took. And while lawyers traded barbs and politicians scored points, the real question remained unanswered. Could this engineering catastrophe actually be fixed, or was Sydney about to inherit a $3 billion disaster? The short answer is yes, the M6 can be saved, but it requires some of the most expensive and technically demanding solutions in modern civil engineering, like grouting. Grouting involves drilling a precise pattern of holes into the unstable rock and pumping specialized cement mixtures under high pressure. The grout penetrates every crack and void, essentially gluing the shattered rock back into a solid, stable mass that can be safely excavated. For severely unstable zones, ground freezing offers a more extreme solution. Engineers drill pipes around the tunnel path and circulate supercooled brine through them, dropping temperatures low enough to freeze all water in the surrounding soil and rock. The unstable mud becomes concrete hard ice that can support excavation. Once past the fault zone, the tunnel lining itself needs redesigning. Rigid concrete shells will crack if the fault shifts even slightly in future. Engineers can install flexible lining with yielding elements, essentially giant shock absorbers built into the tunnel walls that compress and deform rather than shatter. The original 2025 opening date is now a joke. Official estimates put completion at late 2028 at the earliest, but government officials have privately admitted it could stretch well into the 2030s. That means a project that was supposed to be open by now might not serve commuters for another six to eight years or more. For Sydney's southern suburbs, the wait continues. Local streets remain choked with traffic. Those 23 sets of lights still slow every journey. 2,000 trucks still thunder through residential areas. The 15 minutes of time savings remain a promise unfulfilled, and a $3 billion question mark sits waterlogged beneath their feet. So, what do you think about Sydney's billion-dollar underground disaster? Do you believe the contractor's claims about an unprecedented geological fault? Or was this a failure of planning and oversight? Share your thoughts in the comments below. If you found this deep dive into one of Australia's most expensive engineering failures fascinating, give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel for more investigative looks at the world's most controversial mega projects. Until next time, stay curious.